resolution until further in his waistcoat as I announced my name. Mr. Heathcliff, I said. A nod was the answer. Mr. Lockwood, your new tenant, sir. I do myself the honor of calling as soon as possible after my arrival to express the hope that I have not inconvenienced you by my perseverance in soliciting the occupation of Thrushcross Grange. I heard yesterday you had some thoughts. Thrushcross Grange is my own, sir, he interrupted wincing. I should not allow anyone to inconvenience me if I could hinder it. Walk in. The walk in was uttered with closed teeth and expressed the sentiment, go to the deuce. Even the gate over which he leaned manifested no sympathizing movement to the words, and I think that circumstance determined me to accept the invitation. I felt interested in a man who seemed more exaggeratedly reserved than myself. When he saw my horse's beast, fairly pushing the barrier, he did pull out his hand to enchain it, and then sullenly preceded me up the causeway, calling as we entered the court, Joseph, take Mr. Lockwood's horse and bring up some wine. Here we have the whole establishment of domestics, I suppose, was the reflection suggested by this compound order. No wonder the grass grows up between the flags, and cattle are the only edge cutters. Joseph was an elderly, nay, an old man, very old perhaps, though hale and sinewy. The Lord help us, soliloquies in an undertone of peevish displeasure, while relieving me of my horse, looking meantime in my face so sourly that I charitably conjectured he must have need of divine aid to digest his dinner, and as by his ejaculation had no reference to my unexpected advent. Wuthering Heights is the name of Mr. Heathcliff's dwelling, Wuthering being a significant provincial adjective, descriptive of the atmospheric tumult to which its station is exposed in termy, stormy weather. Pure bracing ventilation they must have up there at all times. Indeed, one may guess the power of the north wind blowing over the hedge by the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house, and by a range of gaunt thorns all stretching their limbs one way, as if craving alms of the sun. Happily the architect had foresight to build it strong. The narrow windows are deeply set in the wall, and the corners defended with large jutting stones. Before passing the threshold, I paused to admire a quantity of grotesque carving lavished over the front, and especially about the principal door, above which, among a wilderness of crumbling griffins and shameless little boys, I detected the date, 1500, and the name, Ayrton Earnshaw. I would have made a few comments, and requested a short history of the place from the surly owner, but his attitude at the door appeared to demand my speedy entrance or complete departure, and I had no desire to aggravate his impatience previous to inspecting the pendulum. One step brought us into the family sitting room without any introductory lobby or passage. They call it here the house. Mr. Heath.
much agitate me. Let me hope my constitution is almost peculiar. My dear mother used to say I should never have a comfortable home, and only last summer I proved myself perfectly unworthy of one. While enjoying a month of fine weather at the seacoast, I was thrown into company of the most fascinating creature, a real goddess in my eyes, as long as she took no notice of me. I never told my love vocally, still, if looks have language, the merest idiot might have guessed I was over head and ears. She understood me at last, and looked a return the sweetest of all imaginable looks. And what did I do? I confess it with shame, shrunk icily into myself like a snail, and every glance retired colder and farther, till finally the poor innocent was led to doubt her own senses, and overwhelmed with confusion at her supposed mistake, persuaded her mama to decamp. By this curious turn of disposition, I have gained the reputation of a deliberate artlessness. How undeserved I alone can appreciate. I took a seat at the end of the hearthstone opposite that toward which my landlord advanced, and filled up an interval of silence by attempting to caress the canine mother who had left her nursery and was sneaking wolfishly to the back of my legs, her lip curled up and her white teeth watering for a snatch. My care caress provoked a long guttural sound. You'd better let the dog alone, growled Mr. Heathcliff, in unison checking fiercer demonstrations with a punch of his foot. She's not accustomed to being spoiled, not kept for a pet. Then striding to a side door, he shouted again, Joseph. Joseph mumbled indistinctly in the depths of the cellar, but gave no intimation of his ascending. So his master dived down to him, leaving me via V with the ruffian bitch and a pair of grim, shaggy sheep dogs, who shared with her a jealous guardianship over all my movements. Not anxious to come in contact with their fangs, I sat still, but imagining they would scarcely understand that, as in insults, I unfortunately indulged in winking and making faces at the trio. Some turn of my physiognomy so irritated Madame that she suddenly broke into a fury and leapt on my knees. I flung her back and hastened to interpose the table between us. This proceeding roused the whole hive. Half a dozen four footed fiends of various sizes and ages issued from hidden dens to the common center. I felt my heels and coat laps subjects of assault, and parrying off the larger combatants as effectually as I could with the poker, I was constrained to demand loud assistance from some of the household in re-establishing peace. Mr. Heathcliff and his man climbed the cellar steps with vexatious phlegm. I don't think they moved one second faster than usual, though the hearth was an absolute tempest of worrying and yelping. Happily, an inhabitant of the kitchen made more dispatch. A lusty dame with tucked up gown, bared arms, and fire flushed cheeks rushed into the midst of us, flourishing a frying pan, and used that weapon and her tongue to such purpose that the storm subsided magically, and she only remained heaving like a sea after a high wind when her master entered on the scene. What the devil is the matter, he asked, eyeing me in a manner that I could ill endure after this inhospitable treatment. What the devil in see, indeed, I muttered. The herd of possessed swine could have had no worse spirits in them than those animals of yours, sir. You might as well leave a stranger with a brood of tigers. They won't meddle with persons who touch nothing. He remarked, putting the bottle before me. 
financial considerations of the folly of offending a good tenant, relaxed a little in the laconic style of chipping of his pronouns and auxiliary verbs, and introduced what he supposed would be a subject of interest to me, a discourse on the advantages and disadvantages of my present place of retirement. I found him very intelligent. Oh.